Good morning. Welcome to the next installment of Shepherd School, where we're trying to learn how to be better shepherds for each other by imitating the Good Shepherd himself, Jesus Christ. Now, I have a question for you to start off with. Have you ever wondered what Jesus was talking about in John 10.10, 10, when he said that he came not only to, to, to give us life, but to give us life more abundantly? What is that abundant life he's talking about? Have you ever wondered that? Or do you know what Paul was referring to when he said that, uh, when he referred to that which is truly life in 1 Timothy 6.19? Well, in general terms, in a broad way, both John and Paul were talking about um, believers living the lives that God intended them to live. And I don't mean the right job or the right spouse or the right car, or the right neighborhood. I'm talking about the spiritual life or the, the inner life. Now, what if I told you that that abundant life, or we could say that thriving life, requires equal measures of two separate things that actually seem opposite, but they're really not? Would it sound weird to you if I said that to have that life which is truly life, to thrive, you have to have equal parts strength and weakness? If you have to have equal parts authority and vulnerability? Well, let me prove it to you. Right now, you're seeing something of a graph. The vertical line represents uh, authority or strength or power or whatever synonym you choose. The horizontal represents vulner vulnerability or weakness, things like that. And these two lines divide the graph into four parts. Let's look through those parts one at a time, but not in, not in numerical order. Let's start, with, excuse me, let's start with the section labeled with Roman numeral two in the bottom right. It's called suffering because that's what happens when people who are highly vulnerable or weak have no authority or strength. Think of, of prisoners in a concentration camp or maybe child abuse victims, things like that. Now, now go to the opposite corner labeled the Roman numeral four. People there have high authority or strength or power, but no vulnerability. Think of guards in the prison camp or, or child abusers. A lot of times people like this will see themselves as basically all powerful. So they do whatever they want to the people in their power. And that's called exploitation or another synonym for that more common is abuse. Now drop straight down to Roman numeral quadrant three, uh, Roman numeral three quadrant, excuse me. This one is harder to understand because it's less obvious. But if someone has no power, yet also no vulnerability, what are they? Well, honestly, are usually they're withdrawn. This condition hides itself in comfort or safety. Think of like a comfort zone, but it is better explained with things like apathy and self-isolation. And I'm not talking about like in the quarantine. And that leaves just room number one, flourishing or thriving or abundant life. But what is so curious about this area is that it requires equal parts, strength and weakness. In the prison camp example, Liberating soldiers who would come into a prison camp have power, they're armed, and weakness because they're mortal and their enemies are also armed. But let's put this into real life terms and then let's talk about Jesus, our good shepherd. Flourishing or thriving is keeping your own needs in check so that you can meet the needs of others. It's a family caring joyfully for a bedridden or severely disabled or handicapped family member. It is putting yourself at risk by picking up groceries for an elderly uh, neighbor who really shouldn't be going to the store right now. It's getting into the very messy life of a Christian sister who is maybe whose family is racked by sin and sickness and doing so without burdening her with the very real struggles you have in your own life. In short, being both weak and strong at the same time is showing love and no one is ever stronger or weaker at the same time than our shepherd Jesus. In Luke 5, we see an account of Jesus not too long after he entered public ministry, after he started doing work in public. And we see in Luke 5.12 that a leper came to Jesus to ask for help. Luke 5.12 says, While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now I have another question for you. Who initiated this contact? The leper came to Jesus uh, the leper, uh, there, there came a man full of leprosy. He came to Jesus, but only because Jesus was already in the leper's town while he was in one of the cities, the verse says. 
Jesus still went to where people needed him. He went to where he was needed, which inspired and enabled those who needed him to come to him, to do their part, to come the rest of the way. Our job is to go to where people are who need Jesus. In effect, offer Jesus to as many people as you can. That gives them the opportunity to do their part. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, the old saying goes. Or in this case, you can take water to the horse, but you can't make him drink. But one thing you can know for sure is that if you never connect the horse and the water, the horse will never drink. We must go to where the people are who need Jesus, no matter how different from us they may seem. You've heard me talk before about an author called Rosaria Butterfield. She is a pastor's wife. She's a Christian author and speaker. And she used to be a lesbian ultra-liberal English professor who was directly and aggressively opposed to Jesus, the Bible, and Christians. That's by her own uh, testimony, by her own admission. So how did that come about? How did that change happen? Well, a pastor who had seen one of her articles, one that was attacking uh, promise keepers, wrote her a letter not denouncing her or arguing with her or calling her names or condemning her, but asking her questions. Asking her questions that would lead to her thinking more about the things that she was saying, to help her think. And then, even more significantly, he wrote her to ask if he would join his family for supper. He invited her over. He invited this, uh, uh, um, excuse me, this enemy of Christ, this overt enemy of Christ, into his home, into his life. And then what happened next? It's kind of amazing. Rosaria Butterfield became friends with Canon Floy Smith, the pastor and his wife, because they showed her love. They opened their home and their lives to her and to her friends, and two years after that letter, Rosaria was saved. Why? Not because they argued with her, not because they told her she was wrong and they were right, but because they loved her. They had compassion on her, like Jesus has had compassion on the leper in Mark's account of the same event in Mark 141, it says that Jesus was moved with pity for this leper. And the leper was certainly worthy of pity. He had nothing but weakness. His plea to Jesus was one of absolute and complete weakness. He had nothing to offer Jesus. He had no right to be that close to Jesus. He had no physical hope of healing. Leprosy was a, was a death sentence and there was no cure for it. All he had was faith. He said to Jesus, if you will, you can, which is nothing more than recognizing his own weakness and Jesus's strength. He had faith, which for you and me means nothing more than recognizing our own weakness and Jesus's strength. But because his faith was in Jesus, the leper was healed. Luke 5.13 says, And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. I love that phrase, if you will, you can. And then Jesus says, I will. It sounds like a, a modern self-actualization motto. This, if you will, you can, you know. But that's, not, that's exactly the opposite of what's, what's happening here. What's really being said here is, if God will, he can. It's a statement of God's power, of his greatness, of his strength. That was true physically for the leper, and it's true spiritually for every human, for you, for me, for everybody, everybody on the planet, everybody who ever has been. Because all people are born spiritually needy, spiritually dead. We have more needs spiritually than that leper had physically. And that's, that's actually the beginning of the good news. Because the help that we need is called grace. And grace, like heaven itself, is a free gift offered by God to man. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, in Jesus Christ our Lord. And we all need heaven. We all need that to be free because we can't get there ourselves. And that's because of our sin, which all of us have done. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody is a sinner. And so nobody can get to heaven by themselves. So God has to give it to us. In fact, not only does he need to give it to us, he wants to give it to us. 1 John 4.8 says that God is love. And there is no... A qualifier on that. He loves you. He loves me. He loves every other person. And because he loves us, he sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die in our place. 
John 3.16, most familiar verse in the Bible, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, have eternal life. And all we have to do to gain this sin, excuse me, to gain this forgiveness for sin, to gain this eternal life, to gain heaven, is re reject our sins. And like that leper who trusted Jesus completely, put all of our trust in Jesus for salvation. Acts 16.31 says, And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. That's all we have to do. God offers sal salvation freely to you and to me. So believe today. If you don't know Jesus, believe today. He wants to be your shepherd too. Now to this point in our account here, Jesus has done, uh, everything that he has done has been overtly shepherdy. He's been really obviously a shepherd in this situation so far. Although we can only imitate some of it. We can't imitate everything Jesus has done so far in this story. We can't heal people physically with a word. Uh, what we can do, though, is go to where people need Jesus and offer whatever help that we're able to offer. We can copy him in that. But what Luke records next in this situation about Jesus seems kind of counterintuitive. It's not what we would necessarily expect. But ultimately, it reveals a side of our good shepherd that we rarely think of, but that we need to cling to and, and hold as precious, because it is. So Jesus didn't want recognition for what he had just done. He does an unexpected order, and he does that here in Luke 5, 14. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest, and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. So you'd think that Jesus would want as much recognition, as much following as possible. Uh, and that is exactly what would happen if word of his healing got out. He can do amazing things that no one else can do. But instead, he tells the leper to follow Old Testament laws about what to do after you are recovered from an illness or when you've gotten over a disease. So basically, Jesus is communicating here, don't point to me, just treat this like an ordinary situation. You know, go on about your lives, citizens, there's nothing to see here, that kind of thing. Just, just go on like normal. That's all Jesus wanted the leper to do. But, as usually happens when Jesus told people not to tell about him, they did. So the healed leper disobeys Jesus, Luke 5.15. But now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. Because naturally... Someone who could cure incurable diseases with a word is going to gain some attention, obviously. And in those days, Jesus traveled from city to city, city, town to town, to get his message out. So he was always in the public eye. He was always available to be thronged by the crowd. And so he was. His popularity made, them, made things more difficult for him, though. Instead of traveling freely and spending time with the people he chose to spend time with, his travel was hindered, and he had to work harder to get to the people he wanted to reach. If nothing else, at very least, life was more tiring for him. But this is where we see that other side of the Good Shepherd, that, that hidden, almost secret side that is so important for us to understand and to imitate. Because what we can see now is that Jesus had hidden weakness. And we never think of weakness when we think of Jesus, right? He's God. He's the creator. He literally, with his own words, created everything. So we don't think of weakness when we think of Jesus. But he, he was. He had weakness. We talked earlier about the need for being both strong and weak at the same time. And nobody in history has ever embodied that as fully as Jesus Christ. And never was his weakness more obvious than when he was alone. That's what I mean by a hidden weakness. He didn't advertise it. He didn't flaunt it. In other words, Jesus' weakness was hidden. And, and not because he was embarrassed about his weakness. Not because he wanted everybody to think he was strong. Jesus' weakness was hidden because that's what was best for the people he was ministering to. His weaknesses did not help the people he was working with. Not at that point. They help us now to learn from and to imitate but they didn't help him help them with the, the work he was doing then. And so he didn't put them out front. He didn't advertise them. Luke gives us a little glimpse of what Jesus' weakness looked like. Not only the fact that he was weak in some ways, but what that meant, what that looked like, how that manifested in, in the life of Jesus when he was on earth. Luke 5.16, But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. 
And notice this is important that this is not a one-time thing. It's not like, oh, one time Jesus had this idea to go pray. No, this was a habit of Jesus's. He would, he would when he could, which wasn't often, pull himself away from other people, go be alone with the Father in prayer. And his, so his weakness, his humanity, his dependence on the Father through prayer was just as important to his being the good shepherd as was his strength. They were both essential. How do we know that? Jesus never did anything that wasn't essential. Jesus was flawless. He accomplished everything the Father sent him to do. He did it all in the amount of time that God gave him to do it. Jesus never did anything that was not essential. So his times in prayer with the Father, the times where his weakness was the driving uh, force behind his choices and his actions, those were essential to his being a good shepherd. And our weaknesses, our ability to relate to people because we struggle with sin too, our dependence on the Father through prayer, our weaknesses are just as important as our strengths, our knowledge or our wisdom, our resources, our experience, our gifts, whatever our strengths are. Our weaknesses are just as important as our strengths. And we have to have both of those in equal measure combined if we are going to be shepherds, if we are going to thrive as shepherds and help other people do the same thing. Jesus' weakness drove him to his knees in prayer, in dependence on the Father. And his strength drove him to reach out to people who no one else would reach out to, think of the leper, so that he could help them. He reached them so that he could help them. Or in other words, he used his strength to overcome others' weaknesses. And to be the shepherds that we need to be, we have to embrace our weaknesses as something that increase our dependence on God and then use our strength at the same time to help other people overcome their weaknesses. God designed and intends us to complement each other so that his church will be built and will show off his already there greatness. And we do that by shepherding each other. And we can only be good shepherds when we accept our strengths as gifts from God and our weaknesses as gifts from God. And both of them drive us to shepherd uh, each other and to depend on God for his glory. Then we can be good shepherds. Then we can imitate the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we have a vast array of weaknesses. We sometimes feel like we have no strength whatsoever. But Lord, you have given us both strength and weakness for your glory. Please humble us. Help us to depend on you and help us to use what resources and strengths and abilities you have given us to glorify you by shepherding your people, by reaching out to those who uh, would seem uh, undesirable to reach to, those who would be outside our comfort zone or outside our normal people groups. Lord, help us to reach out to the people who you want us to reach so that we can glorify you by showing them who you are and shepherding them to you, the Good Shepherd. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Hey guys, quick follow-up here. If you want to know more about strength and weakness and their connection to each other and how that they influence and should influence the life of a believer, I highly recommend the book Strong and Weak by Andy Crouch. That is the, the basis for a lot of what I talked about in the sermon today, um, other than the Bible, obviously. Uh, but it is, a, it is a powerful book full of scripture that points us to Christ and holds him up as the example of how to be strong and weak at the same time. It really is uh, a good tool to help you grow to be more like the Good Shepherd. Again, the book is called Strong and Weak by Andy Crouch. Of course, it's not perfect. There are things in it that probably uh, wouldn't necessarily agree with, but the overall premise is very good, and the, de the, the definite emphasis of be more like Jesus, you can't argue with that. Strong and Weak by Andy Crouch. I highly recommend it.